Go, no, and oh. <laughs> because when you think about Noah, that's, uh, I may do that numerous times. <laughs> Jonah, with Jonah, when you're going through the account of Jonah, that's kind of what you see is that God has to tell him not just once but twice to go. And Jonah does not want to do that because this is one of the key points of the lesson. Jonah doesn't see anything in this for him. Him going doesn't give him anything. Him preaching there doesn't give him anything. The people repenting surely doesn't give him anything. Them repenting and God relenting of the terror that he promised doesn't give him anything. And so Jonah doesn't want to do it. But then when he's in the depth of the sea and he sees this great fish coming at him, it's kind of like, maybe God's pretty serious about me going anyway. And he has that moment. And so those are some of the things we're going to be looking at this morning with, with Jonah. The, the word uh, Jonah means dove. And you've probably heard that before. And the word dove that's used in the, when it's used in the scriptures, usually does have this idea of peace attached to it. And so Jonah really should have been considered this offering of God of peace, this messenger of God that would bring peace and reconciliation between God and a great people. And in thinking about Jonah, he is indeed God's prophet. There's another place where he's mentioned, and that's in 2 Kings chapter 14 and verse 25. And there it just very briefly talks about King Jeroboam II, which Jonah was a prophet during his reign. And um, it just mentions that he was there and he was the prophet of God. During this time period as well, he was most likely a contemporary between both uh, with both Hosea and Amos. Some suppose that he was probably um, before them, at the very beginning of them, and so he may actually be the oldest of the prophetic writings that we have. Uh, but it was also during this time, as I said a moment ago, that King Jeroboam II was reigning, and the book was written more about the prophet than it was about the message that he was preaching. During this reign and during this time period, you had the Assyrian Empire, which was a very evil empire, probably the most evil that had existed up until that time. They were very, very uh, brutal in the things that they would do. Some of the things they would do would, when they conquered a city, they would uh, fillet some of the men, skin some of the men, and they would put their skins on the walls to let all the nations around them know, do not mess with us. They would also take the skulls of many of the people they killed, both men, women, and children, and they would create walls, build walls, with the skulls of their victims. They showed no partiality when it came to killing. They would kill a, a woman or a child just as quickly and easily as they would a man. So they were very, very brutal. But during the time of this writing, it's most likely the case that the Assyrian Empire was on its decline and was about to be conquered. Nineveh being the chief city of Assyria and God letting them know that within 40 days this city is going to be overthrown shows you the, the weakness that they were already exposed to and that God is letting them know they're going to be coming down. However, Jerusalem and Israel at this time were going through a period of prosperity. They were rising in prominence. Jonah, being a prophet of Israel, was prophesying for that northern kingdom. And that northern kingdom was very, very corrupt. Remember, they never had a good king in Israel. However, they were enjoying a period of prosperity. And so this mortal enemy of Assyria seems to be toppling at the same time that Israel and Judah seem to be rising in prominence and power. And it's during this particular stage that God decides, okay, you know what? Nineveh is going to be destroyed in 40 days, and I'm going to destroy them in 40 days unless they repent. I don't want them to be destroyed. I want their souls to be saved. And so he sends his prophet. And so when we go to Jonah chapter 1, the charge does indeed come to Jonah to go to Nineveh and to preach, it, to preach against that city. And so God's message to him is to arise and go. One of the things that's unique about Jonah is that Jonah is actually sent to this Gentile nation. The other prophets that we read about, they're always prophesying about the other nations but they're doing it from within the borders of either Judah or Israel. Jonah is actually sent to them. And one of the lessons I think we can learn from that is that the, the message of deliverance, the message of peace for us, the gospel, is not a message about sinners. It's a message for sinners. And so when we talk about salvation and we talk about the gospel, it's not so that we can look at the worlds around us and say, yes, salvation is of God, and look at all these nations that aren't obeying it, so much as it is the message of God is about salvation, so let me go and share it with them. And this is what Jonah was charged with doing. 
Jonah also, and you'll notice this throughout the book, that Jonah goes down in verse 3. It talks about him going down to the docks, and he finds a, a ship that's going down to Tarshish. And then when he gets in the boat, you'll see in that chapter that he goes down into the bottom of the boat. Later we're going to see that he goes down into the depths of the sea. He's swallowed by the great fish, and the great fish goes down to the very uh, cores of the mountain of the sea. Over and over and over again, you see that Jonah, doing what he wants to do, is continually sinking lower and lower and lower. And God is in none of his thoughts as he's doing those things, except for this. I don't want to do what God wants me to do, and I want to hide from his presence. And so instead of taking about the 500-mile trip to Nineveh, like God said, he's going to take a 2,000-mile trip to Tarshish to go out from the presence of the Lord because he doesn't even want to be around him. Now, it's not that God cannot see or that he's really hiding from God. Psalm 139, that whole psalm really, but especially the first 12 verses, speak to the fact, where can I go from the presence of the Lord? If I go to the highest heights or the, the lowest depths, if I go here, if I go there, if in the, in the brightness of the day or the darkness of the night, even my innermost thoughts, none of these things are hidden from God. God sees and knows it all. And so I don't believe it's that Jonah believed that he necessarily could not be seen by God so much as it was most of the gods during that time were believed to be territorial, that this was a god of the Philistines or even a god of this particular nation. And so when Jonah's going there, it may be that he's actually aligning himself and saying, I'm no longer going to be a part of of God's kingdom or God's purposes. I'm going to join myself to this particular nation or this particular God. It may be because of that he did think that God could not see him. But it seems a little bit hard for me to, to comprehend that he did think that because of some of the other things that he says. Because in this chapter we see that as he goes down into the bottom of the ship, he falls asleep. And then there's this horrible storm that comes up. And these mariners would have been familiar with storms. This was not something that they would have been unfamiliar with. There were hurricanes and things like that that were occurring during that time period as well. However, even the mariners understood that there was something very different about this storm. And they are terrified. They begin to cry out to their gods. They begin to pray. But Jonah's down in the ship, and he's asleep. And so this, pag this pagan comes down and asks him, what do you mean by doing this? Arise, O oh sleeper. What do you mean by sleeping during this time? Call upon your God. And so one of the things that we see is that this Jonah, who is a prophet of God, seems to be the only one on the ship who's an atheist, who's not crying out to his God while all the rest of them are. And they recognize that this is not some ordinary storm, but it's extraordinary in nature. And it must be somebody's God who is bringing this upon us and causing this turmoil. And so this pagan is the one who has to admonish the prophet to be about praying. And that's always a sad occurrence when you have those who say that they believe in God. However, there are others in the world who are having to say, could you pray with me? Would you pray with me? Don't you think we ought to be praying about this thing? When we are the ones who ought to be leading that and setting the example for it. And so at that time when they begin to pray, you also see that these pagans have a lot of virtues as well. Is that Jonah realizes that Jehovah, the real God, who is the God of the land and the sea, who is all-powerful, almighty, and these pagans come to realize that this God that Jonah is serving is the true and mighty God who is causing this. Jonah says, here's the solution. Cast me overboard. And what you see the pagans do next is this. They begin to row very strongly and strenuously because they don't seem to be willing to just throw this man overboard. It doesn't seem what they want to be doing. However, because of the fact that nothing they are doing, the praying, the rowing, and everything else, none of these things are accomplishing what they want, the peace of the sea. They do as Jonah says that his God says to do, to cast him overboard. And immediately when that happens, it's just as it was when Jesus said to the winds and the waves, peace be still, there's a calm that falls over the sea. But that's not the end for Jonah. And so you can imagine as Jonah is thrown overboard, he begins to sink deeper and deeper into the depths of the ocean in, in chapter 2, that what we have there is a prayer 
at the end of chapter 1, or at the end of chapter 1, verse 16 first, Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. God was able to use even the disobedience, even the rebellion of Jonah, the bad example of Jonah. But God was able to use that prophet even then to bring about some understanding, some worship, some repentance when it comes to the relationship between Jehovah and even these pagans. But when they cast him overboard, it says that God prepared a great fish. And this great fish came and swallowed Jonah in verse 17 of chapter 1. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Sorry about this. That's hard for a lot to swallow. <laughs> Jesus looks back at this account and he says that this is a true event. And just as it was that this sign of Jonah being in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights and being alive in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights and that being a sign that when he spit back on the ground that God was able to accomplish such a thing as that, who could live through such a process and that bring about the repentance of a great city? Jesus points back to this later when they're asking for a sign. He says, no sign is going to be given to you except the sign of Jonah that the Son of Man is going to go into the earth for three days and three nights, but He's going to come back, and He's going to be alive, and He's going to be well. And that's going to prove to you and show to you who the real God is. Will it bring repentance is what Jesus' question is all about. But one of the things that you notice is that Jonah is not praying prior to this. God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh. Jonah does not pray before he goes to the dock. He does not pray before he boards the ship. He does not pray before he lays his head down to sleep. He has to be awoken from his sleep and be told to pray. But at this particular moment of time, he did, as, as Trey led in the singing a moment ago, he did think to pray. And his prayer was one that was probably the most heartfelt, the most meaningful, and the most sincere that he had ever offered in his, in his entire life. But if you notice that this prayer that we have recorded for us is not recorded as he's praying it, but it's prayed as he's looking back at what he prayed, or it's quoted as what he prayed looking back. But it's still within the belly of the fish. And so as you go through this, you see that it is indeed a prayer of thanksgiving, and it's actually a prayer of thanksgiving for the fish itself. My soul, verse 7 of chapter 2, fainted within me. I remember the Lord, and my prayer went up to went up to you into your holy temple, being in the bottom of the ocean, in the belly of a fish, separated from God by the distance he tried to draw himself to. Even there, God in his holy temple was able to hear his prayer. He was not separated from God's ears. Those who regard worthless idols, verse 8, forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. He points out that he understood that this fish that God had, had uh, created was not for his destruction, but it was for his deliverance. And often what happens is when we're trying to get away from what it is that God wants us to do, we're going to find ourselves in some hard circumstances. We're going to find ourselves depressed. We're going to find ourselves angry. We're going to find ourselves feeling like a victim. We're going to find ourselves in a, in a host of all other problems because you cannot reap something different than what you've sown. And God has made that an, un an unalterable decree. You will get what you've been asking for. And this is what Jonah was asking for. But God put him in that situation. And in this chapter, he even describes it as being a, a grave. And how it was that when he was sinking into the water, the weeds and things like that began to wrap themselves around his leg, dragging him deeper and deeper and deeper. God put him through that not to destroy him but to save him. Jonah, this is what I told you to do. This is what I require of you. And this is what happens when you try to run from me. I will find you. More than that, I will look for you. More than that, I will create for you a means of deliverance. But you're not going to like it. Because right now, Jonah, the thing that you're thinking about is what is in it for you. And you're not thinking about what I am trying to accomplish. And what I'm trying to accomplish through you. And the talents and the abilities that I have given you and blessed you with. 
and the role and job and, and responsibility that you have as being my prophet. And you don't get that. But you need to get it. And so Jonah, it seems, when he is in this fish, is the same as David in Psalm 32. That Psalm 32, as David is repenting of his sin with Bathsheba, as we've looked at several times before. And David talks about the hardship and turmoil that he was having when he kept silent. Psalm 32, verses 4 and 5. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Jonah is no different, that he realized that this prayer that he's offering to God, God will hear it, and God's hand has been heavy upon him, but God will deliver. And so even as Jonah is praying this prayer, you see that there's this great idea of hope that not only does, does he offer this prayer to God and God will hear it in his temple, but even in this prayer he talks about, I will see your courts again one day and I will offer praise to you and I will offer sacrifices and I will perform the vow that I've made to you. And this prayer is not one that he is uttering from the shoreline, but from the belly. It's not one where he's on the shoreline saying, oh, okay, God, you've delivered me, so now I'm going to do these things. No, he's in the belly saying, God, you're going to deliver me, and so I will do what I said I will do. Because I know this, you will deliver me. That is one of the hardest prayers for us to many times pray, I believe. That we know on the opposite side, once we've made it to safety, we look back and say, God, thank you for deliverance. Rightfully so. But do we in the midst of that have enough faith, have enough confidence, have enough trust in God? God, you will deliver me from this. I will make it through the other side because you have promised and I believe in what you have said. So as we were singing this morning, when you left your room this morning, did you think to pray? Before you open up Facebook, did you think to pray? Before you turn on the news, did you think to pray? Before you go into a discussion with a brother or sister about something you have a disagreement about, did you think to pray? Or was it about what is this, what's in this for me? What do I want to accomplish in this? Or should it be, what does God want me to accomplish in this? And how would God want me to address this? I belong to him, not the world. I belong to him because I have a great responsibility to shine forth the light and to be an ambassador for Christ, to let others know this is how brethren treat one another. Or do I look at it as what's in it for me and what am I trying to accomplish? How can I win the argument? That's what Jonah got put into the belly of a fish to learn. And you know what happens, what it's like in the belly of a fish? It stinks. You know why your life kind of stinks? That's probably why. That's the lesson for us. So Jonah has this prayer of repentance that he offers up to God. And as it says in Micah 7, verses 8, 18 through 20, that who is a God like the God that we serve that forgives iniquities and transgressions, that takes them and separates them like the east from the west or casts them out into the midst of the sea? Where was Jonah's baptism, as it were? Where was his sins left behind in the midst of the sea? But it doesn't mean that Jonah's attitude still did not need to change. And so when you get into chapter 3, what you see is that God again comes to Jonah. And this is the message that he tells Jonah. I said go. And when you read what God says to Jonah at the beginning of chapter 3, it's no different than what God said to Jonah at the beginning of chapter 1. His commandment is exactly the same because God's mind has not changed on the subject. God's mind has not been deterred from the purpose that he intended. But God is showing how gracious he is to not just the people that he's being sent to, but God is also showing how gracious he is to Jonah. Because what he's giving Jonah is a second chance to do these things. He's letting him know that this is what I want you to do. You didn't want to do it. God can understand why you don't want to do what he wants you to do. He knows you're made of flesh. He knows you're nothing but dust. He knows you can't see beyond today's events. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So God can understand all those different reasons for why we don't want to do what it is he tells us to do. But this is what we're supposed to understand. God's message does not change to accommodate for former rebellion and disobedience. Because this is what we're supposed to learn from that. God does not care that you don't want to do what he wants you to do. 
God does care that you don't care about what he wants you to do. That's the problem. Because the problem is not with God. The problem is with me. And so when God looks down upon us, he understands, he sympathizes. But this is what must happen. We must be holy as he is holy. So Jonah, this is what I want you to do. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it. And let them know that in 40 days they're going to be destroyed if they do not repent. That is more important than what you want, Jonah. That's more important than how you feel about this, Jonah. This is the thing that you were set aside by me to do, Jonah. And this is the thing that, Jonah, I know you can do. Stop trusting in yourself and start believing in me. And we can get this done. And that's what God wants from him. Romans 3 and verse 4. Let God be true and every man a liar. That's strong language. But it lets us know that we're supposed to understand the purposes of God. Repent or perish. Harsh message. Forty days from now, you're going to be destroyed. Very harsh message. message. But that was a message of grace. Why is it that we sometimes have a hard time dealing with that concept? That a message of grace is only supposed to be about all the good and wonderful and perfect things that you can have. That it's supposed to be a message of gentleness and kindness and lovingness. Jonah's message was not one that fit that mold. This great city of more than 120,000 people, a three days journey to cross it, and Jonah goes everywhere, 40 days, and you're going to be destroyed if you do not repent. Jonah, not wanting to preach the message, how do you think he sounded when he preached the message, even? But his message even rises to the ear of the king. And the king proclaims a fast and sackcloth and ashes, not just on the, on the people, but he says even on the animals do this thing. That we might serve this God that Jonah is preaching. Because guess what? There was a giant fish that came up and spit him out on the land. I think we need to listen to what he's saying. And they changed. And they did the very thing that God wanted them to do. The grace of God that appears to all man, mankind. It teaches us to deny ungodliness, worldly lust. It teaches us to pursue other things instead. And so that message of grace at the very beginning is telling us this. Repent or perish. And that's graciousness from the very, very beginning. And so with Jonah, what we see also in chapter 3 is the great power of that message. Romans 1.16, the, the gospel is God's power unto salvation. It is a powerful message that brings salvation. In Luke 8 and verse 15, the seed that goes out, it has to fall upon that, that uh, soil that's good and noble, that heart that's ready and receptive. That's what Nineveh was. God knew that. And this perfect seed from an imperfect messenger was able to save the entire city. That's how powerful God's message is, even when the messenger is um, imperfect. But at the end of chapter 3, we see this. Jonah's worst fear comes to pass. God saw their works. It was not just that they said they repented. It was not just that they prayed and asked for forgiveness. God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. But when you get to chapter 4, it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. And in verse 2, so Jonah, now he's praying. Though he's angry, he is praying. Though he is upset that his worst fears have come true, he is angry, but he still prays. So he prays to the Lord and says, ah, Lord, this was, was this not what I said to you while I was still in my country? Did I have to really come way out here to this city? Did I really have to go through all these things that I went through? Did I, do I really have to, have to go to your enemies because they're the enemies of your people? Did I really have to do all these things just for you to forgive them? Is this not what I told you? Is this not what I said? Is this not what I understood would happen? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious 
and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. If that was in the Psalms, it would be a beautiful passage. If it was in the Psalms, it's a beautiful passage. If it's said by Paul to the Roman brethren, beautiful passage. With Jonah, it's a complaint. I knew you'd forgive them because that's just the kind of God you are. Brethren, God asks him the question, is it right for you to be angry? Not are you angry. Is it right for you to be angry? Later in this same chapter in verse 9, then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Why was Jonah so angry? Look at that list. How many of those things today are causing anger? And is this not some of the things that even Jonah may have been angry about? Assyria was going to conquer Israel shortly. What's in it for, what's in it for Jonah? What's in it for him? He can't come back to Israel and say that he's done something great. You know those people who have been trying to conquer us all these years, these people who have put us down, these people who have enslaved us, these people who torture us and kill us, these people who are erecting cities on the bones of others? I preached a good message to them. And wouldn't you know it, they received it. You think his own nation is going to receive him back? Could he look at Assyria and say that that's a depraved people and hate them just because of their nationality or their race? They're not deserving of that time and attention. But from one blood, God made all the nations. And every soul belongs to him. They don't belong to Jonah. And they don't belong to Israel. They belong to God. Could he look at that nation and, and say, what am I supposed to do now? Jonah's disobedience sent him to a place he did not want to go, to the belly of a fish. Now, Jonah's obedience gave him what he didn't want, a whole nation being forgiven. So whether he disobeyed God or obeyed God, Jonah doesn't get what he wants. See a problem with that? And what does he do with it? He blames God. He blames him. Because who else can he blame? God's not leaving him alone. God's always hounding him. He tries to run. God chases him. Chases him so much he creates a fish to pluck him from the sea and take him to the bottom of it to let him see the grave that he has dug for himself. And that God is serious about what he says. When God says go, you go. When God says preach, you preach. When God says forgive, you forgive. And you understand that it's God's purpose that you're supposed to be keeping in mind, not your own. Because you know what the, what's going to make your life blessing a blessing? It's doing it God's way. Because as we said, that statement made by Jonah in the Psalms is a beautiful thing. Everywhere else in the scripture you find such a statement. It's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing. It's a blessing. We read such a thing, we say, amen, praise our God. But when I'm thinking selfishly, only about myself, what am I going to get out of it? What's my family going to get out of it? What's my congregation going to get out of it? What's my country going to get out of it? What's my race going to get out of it? When we're thinking like that, you know what you're doing? You're blaming God. That's what you're doing. And that's why Jonah had to learn an important lesson. And brethren, that's why this message is more about Jonah and what he needed to get. None of us the backdrop. And so God makes a very simple lesson and shows him in a very, very easy and simple way that he is going to forgive who he wants to forgive. He's going to show mercy upon the one he wants to show mercy to. God's question for Jonah is, is it right for you to be angry at this time? Matthew 5 and verse, or Ephesians 4 and verse 26. Be angry, but do not sin. If I'm angry and I sin, you are not right to be angry. 
because that anger was misplaced, misunderstood, and you let it have its way with you. It's not right for you to be angry. Matthew 5 and verse 22 talks about be careful about who you're angry with and agree with your adversary along the way because guess what? You may be the one who ends up getting punished for it. Throughout the scriptures, it talks about the danger of anger and the problems that it causes. Let's look in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 9. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 9. Do not hasten in your spirit to be angry. And this is why. Because anger rests in the bosom of fools. Brethren, we should not care if the world tells us how angry we should be. And I'm really not interested in how it is that so many people on social media right now are saying, well, you have to be angry. My God tells me anger rests in the bosom of a fool. And forgive me, I don't want to be a fool. And then when I see some of the things that have been written, as I said last week, there's a lot of fools writing a lot of foolish things. I don't know how I can be more blunt than that. Next week, we are going to talk about this topic more Sunday night. I've been requested to talk about this. But understand, most of us are not going to like it. Just know that. Because God is pretty harsh about the fact that all of us belong to him. Not this world. Not groups and camps. We belong to him. Anger rests in the bosom of a fool. Other places as well. Proverbs 29. Let's go to the Proverbs. And over and over again, the Proverbs warn about anger and the kinds of things that it will do. Be angry, the Bible says, but do not sin. Proverbs 29 verse 22 says this, An angry man, what does he do? He stirs up strife. And a furious man, what does he do? He abounds in transgression. Proverbs 19 and verse 19. Proverbs 19 and verse 19. A man of great wrath will suffer punishment. For if you rescue him, guess what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to do it all over again. One of the things that I've seen that a lot are wasting their time with is when they try to make Facebook appeals to brethren they need to be talking to one-on-one. -on -one. You're trying to rescue someone who's not willing to listen to you. And guess what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to do it all over again in the future. That's why the Bible says you go to your brother one-on-one -on -one and you talk to them. Proverbs 14, verses 6 through 8. Proverbs 14, 6 through 8. A scoffer seeks wisdom. He doesn't find it. But knowledge is easy to him who understands. Go from the presence of a foolish man. Why do you do not perceive in him the lips of knowledge? When you do not perceive in him the lips of knowledge. The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. But the folly of fools is deceit. In verse 17 of the same chapter, it, it then turns to the quick-tempered man. The quick-tempered man acts foolishly. And a man of wicked intentions is hated. Over and over and over again, the Bible points to this. And with Jonah, you see that this is the reason for his constant mood swings. Jonah seems to be out there. God tells him to go to Tarshish. I don't want to go to Tarshish, so he goes somewhere else. He falls asleep in the bottom of the ship. He doesn't care. He's apathetic. He's in the bottom of the ocean in the belly of the fish. And what do you see? I don't want to be here. So now he's happy and thankful that God's going to deliver him. He goes out on the land. He has to preach the message of God. But then the people repent and change. So he's angry and he's frustrated. But then God makes this plant, this, this gold. Give him shade. He's happy again. But then the, the worm comes and eats it in the night and the sun comes up and blows it all away. And he's angry again. Constant mood changes, constant mood swings. Why? Because Jonah is only thinking about himself. God says, is it right for you to be angry, Jonah? Not just about the city. Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? You didn't labor for it. You did nothing for it. I gave it. I'm the one who did that. And what Jonah didn't get is the same lesson that's taught in Job 2 and verse 10. We willingly accept good from the Lord, 
shouldn't we also accept the bad and the adversity? Blessed be the name of the Lord was Job's conclusion. And that's where Jonah is supposed to be as well. God is the one who labored for Nineveh. They weren't Jonah's people. They were God's people. They weren't Jonah's souls. They were God's souls. God created them. Jonah didn't. God created them. And so God wanted to save them. And so God was going to do whatever it took to save them, whether Jonah wanted to do it or not. Because God can still use, whether it's the, the uh, faithful prophet or a fool. God can save by either one. What's Jonah going to be? And that's how interesting the book of Jonah ends. At the end of this, he says this in Jonah chapter 4, verses 9 through the conclusion. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Jonah said, It's right for me to be angry even to death. It's right for me to be angry to death. I'll be angry about it to the day I die. I'll give my life in defense of it was not right for what happened with this plant. Really? But the Lord said, you, had no, you have pity on the plant for which you have not labored or made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a, in a night. Should I not have pity on Nineveh, that great city? Or which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock. And with that, the book ends. I have no idea what Jonah did after that. If he changed his ways or if he, if he started seeing things the way that God wanted him to. The reason we have so many severe mood changes from being elated one day to angry the next is because we'll have pity on something that is small and insignificant. But when it comes to the big picture of what God expects, the big picture of that God is the one who creates, that God is the one who decides, that God is the one who sins, that God is the one who forgives, that God is the one who heals, that God is the one who mends, that God is the one. You have pity on the plant but not on the people? Is it right for you to be angry? What's Jonah going to do? I don't, we don't know. But my question for you this morning is, what is your Nineveh? What is the thing that God has created, that God wants and desires, that whether you obey him, you're not going to get what you want right now, or whether you disobey him, it's going to put you in a place you don't want to go. What is that thing? The hope is this, when you change your worldview, when you change the way that you look at things and start looking at things the way that God wants you to do, therein is found peace. Therein is found comfort. Therein is found salvation. And so if there's someone in the audience this morning that we can help with that, there's a lot of things going on. And as brethren who, who are the children of God, who stand behind God's word, we believe this. We can open up God's word and we can fix it, whatever it is. If you're in the belly of the fish or if you've been spit out and you're ready to start doing it God's way, whatever it is, please let us help. That's what we're here for. As together we stand and sing, won't you please come if we can help?